All right, so we have been in this sermon series talking about that fear is not our future. And as we've been doing that, we have been looking at the life particularly of the prophet Elijah. And next week, we're going to look at Elisha. If you were with us last week, you know that we had this great, spectacular battle of the gods, right? You had the 450 prophets of Baal calling on Baal to come and light the fire out of nothingness. You had Elijah calling upon God to come and bring the fire. And as we all know how that story goes with Elijah, God brought the fire, but the prophets of Baal, there was nothing. So Elijah's on like what I would call a Holy Spirit adrenaline rush, right? Because like when that sort of stuff happens and God shows up in dramatic, spectacular sorts of ways, you cannot help but be super pumped, right? I guess that's, I don't know, pumped, is that the right word to use? So you all are like, I don't understand that, Paul. That goes back to the 80s when you were a kid. Super excited, super stoked, super whatever it is that you want to do, super hyped. Now, how do I know that Elijah was super hyped, well, we know that from Scripture, um, and, and when I read this text, I can't help but think of chariots of fire, and you'll see in just a moment why, but I was like, I should have had the orchestra do like the theme song from chariots of fire, and we could have just done like slow-mo running, right? So in 1 Kings chapter 18, this is how our text would have ended last week. We didn't, I wasn't planning on getting that far, but, but just to kind of see you, this is how Elijah feels at the moment. It says, meanwhile, because now the rains are coming, the fire of God has dropped. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds. The wind rose, a heavy rain started falling, and Ahab rode off to Israel. The power of the Lord came on Elijah, and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. That's running fast. I don't know if you know about that, but when someone's in a chariot and being pulled on a chariot, that goes fairly fast. But Ahab tucks, or Ahab, Elijah tucks everything in and out races Ahab. It's like, you know, the Chariots of Fire movie, Eric Little. It's, there's that great line and he's like, you know, God, God made me for a purpose. God made me fast. When I run, I feel God's pleasure. I'll tell you something. I went for a run yesterday. I did not feel God's pleasure. I am still not feeling God's pleasure, right? And I'm like, and I don't run fast. I mean, it's like, I, it's a terrifying thing, I suspect, to watch me running on the beach. But anyway, um, but this is Elijah, like he is in the moment and he cannot wait to get to Jezreel. And so he runs ahead of, of Ahab because what does he want to see happen? He wants a Nineveh moment, he wants like when Jonah went to Nineveh and he said, hey, you all need to repent. You need to get your life together. You need to get things straightened out. And they all repented and they all dressed in sackcloth and ashes. This is what Elijah wants because he's sick and tired of Ahab always getting his way and always doing his own thing. And so he races to the capital to see what's going to happen to Ahab and Jezebel. And guess what? Nothing. The people of Israel who had fallen down when the fire came down and said, this is God, and they fell down and they worshiped him, they did nothing. Ahab and Jezebel did not all of a sudden come to faith. Nothing happened. And this is now where we pick up the story because not only is nothing going to happen, Jezebel is coming after Elijah. This is 1 Kings chapter 19 Verses 1 through 14. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed the prophets with the sword. By the way, I left that out of the text last Sunday about him slaughtering the 450 prophets. I was like, we'll just skip over that for right now. We'll deal with that one later. That'll be in a Sunday school class someday. So Jezebel sent a messenger, now here's the problem, sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it so ever severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. As in, she's going to take out Elijah. So Elijah was afraid, and he ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. While he himself, and that's going to be important, we're going to come back to that. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, 
He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, which is Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. Then he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? I don't actually know how God spoke this. It could have been flippantly. It could have been sarcastically. It could have been kindly. I don't know. But he asked him this question. What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they too are trying to kill me. They are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face, went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, and this should sound very familiar if you didn't catch it the first time, it's the exact same thing he said. I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Elijah's having a bad day, in case you have not noticed. He's having a bad moment. There's a bad narrative being written around his life, a narrative that he is actually contributing to. As we pick up, we hear that Jezebel has come after him, and he's running as fast as he can. He wants to get away, but it's interesting where he goes. He goes to Beersheba, which is in the southernmost part of the nation of Judah. So remember, we have the northern kingdom of Israel, which is where Ahab and Jezebel were ruling. We have the southern kingdom of Judah. Ahab literally leaves Israel, the northern kingdom, goes down to the very southern part of the southern kingdom of Judah and leaves his servant there. And then he keeps traveling for another day into the desert, eventually making his way all the way down into modern day Egypt at Mount Sinai. Why does scripture tell us that Elijah left his servant in Beersheba and kept traveling south? Elijah is saying this, because you may not catch it in this context. He is saying, I'm done with ministry. I'm done. I'm leaving Israel, the Northern Kingdom. I want nothing to do with them. I want actually nothing to do with the southern kingdom of Judah, even though they're a little more faithful in Israel. I want nothing to do with them. And I'm leaving my servant who is given to him because he's a prophet. I'm leaving him in Beersheba and I'm out of here. I'm done, God. It's over. He had reached his breaking point. Now, If you're paying attention to the church, and I don't mean La Jolla Presbyterian Church, I mean the big C church, particularly in the Western world, particularly in the United States, you will know that this idea of saying I'm done with ministry is happening day after day, week after week, month after month. I cannot tell you the number of my friends that in the last two and a half to three years, have simply walked away from being pastors. They're tired of it. They're tired of the politics. They're tired of the culture wars. They're tired of people not being able to get along. And they basically say, here's my servant. 
and I'm gone. Now, George Barna, who does a lot of research, my nickname for George Barna is Bad News Barna because Barna never says anything positive about anything. I don't know if you pay attention to Barna that much or not, but I'm constantly amazed how there's nothing great that ever comes out of it. But his latest research says this, 40% of all pastors in the Western world have seriously considered leaving the ministry in the last two years. 40%. The great resignation is not just in the secular world, folks. It is also within the church. And I am convinced we need to pray for God's church because too many pastors are simply walking away. They're tired. I wanna say something to you all as those who attend, who watch, who participate in the life of La Jolla Presbyterian Church. I am grateful to be your pastor and the amazing thing this church has been able to model, and I brag about you all to other people about this, is we have somehow, by the grace of God, been able to hold on to the things that really matter. Because guess what? You all disagree on a few things that are happening in our world. How do I know that? I listen to you. I see what you post. I have agitated conversations sometimes with some of you about you wishing I was this or you wishing I was that or I would say this or I would say that or I would say something a little differently than how I said it the last time I said it, right? But I tell people there's something about this congregation. I'm not gonna ask how many of you, I mean, it would be interesting, I'm never, I, well, I shouldn't say never. It's always dangerous to say I'll never do this. I'm not gonna go around and say how many of you all are watching Fox News? How many of you all are watching MSNBC? How many of you are watching CNN? Where is it that you get your stories from? All of that. Because I don't have to because I know. We are a house divided, right? But the amazing to me, thing to me is this. And I continue to pray that this lasts for our church. We have focused on what really matters, and that is Jesus. I pray that we will continue to walk in humility with one another. It does the church no good when pastors simply walk away because people cannot be kind to each other or to their pastor. It is not saying that we cannot disagree. I know we disagree. But I pray that we will continue to strive to walk in humility with each other. To be willing to say, you know what? I might just be wrong. To trust that we actually have good motives. Because that's oftentimes the problem is that people don't trust and we don't trust motives. And we don't trust if people will be kind if we disagree with them. So I just wanna say thank you. Now, I will also say this, that my president, when I was at Princeton Theological Seminary, Tom Gillespie, and I've used this before, he said, you will know that you are in God's will when you have people shooting at you from both sides. <laughs> when you have people upset with you on both sides. And I was like, can I make a rebuttal to that? Because that doesn't sound very comfortable, right? But it's the truth. But what he was trying to say in that was, we've got to keep our focus on Christ and not let all the distractions of the world pull us away from that. Okay. Thank you for allowing me to share those words. Now we're back to Elijah. Elijah is like, I'm done. And God says, uh, no, you're not done. You don't get off that easily. So what does God do? Well, Elijah's in this dark, deep place. 
And the first thing he is, 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 is he's hungry. So what does God do? I, I love, this is such a great teaching example for us to remember when we're dealing with, with people is that we have to be able to meet physical needs. God doesn't go to Elijah and say, hey, you're all messed up. You need to read the four spiritual laws. You need some gospel. You need this. You need that. He feeds him and says, you need to eat. And so Elijah eats. But God is preparing him and helping him to see that God's plans are bigger than Elijah's plans for himself. And God says, you're going to make a journey. Because sometimes when we're in a place of despair, a place of discouragement, we need to make a journey where we can be closer to God. And so that's what happens. Now, if you, have been, if you paid attention to that story to Mount Sinai, to Mount Horeb, you've probably heard some very uh, similar sort of words or phrasing around the life of Moses. Moses has the same sort of journey. Moses, we know the number 40 is a significant number for the nation of Israel. Moses goes up to the top of Mount Sinai to meet with God right after the people had already destroyed, you know, right after the people had already become idolatrous, turned away from God. Moses came down, destroyed the Ten Commandments, right? Had to go back up again, get another set of Ten Commandments. And Moses is struggling with God. Are you really God? Are you really going to lead me? Are you really going to lead the people of God? And he has a very sort of similar encounter to Elijah, but it is a little bit different. And so this is Exodus chapter 33, verse 18. So Moses has been having this conversation with God, and then he says this. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. And when my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. You see, this is the amazing thing of Jesus. That when Christ comes in all of his perfection and all of his glory, what do we get to behold? The face of God. That's why on the Mount of Transfiguration, I am pretty sure the reason of all the prophets and all the people that could have showed up from the Old Testament with Jesus, it's Moses and Elijah talking about the exodus that Jesus must take, talking about the death that Jesus must endure. But I want you to notice something here. The way in which God works is God does reveal himself, but he does it differently with different people. The glory and the presence and the power of God that Moses got to witness looked and sounded different than what Elijah heard and saw. Elijah heard a lot of spectacular things, but God was present in the still, small voice. Moses got to see the backside of God, and that was it. But the promise of Scripture is this, is that God is willing and God does reveal himself to his people. Elijah covers his face because the holy of presence of God is right there. And God is saying, Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah rolls off, right? He's telling God all the things that are wrong with God's plan. And I don't know if you all have ever done that before or not. I am very experienced at letting God know everything that is wrong with God's plan because I view my plan as the right plan. I don't think any of the rest of you all have this problem in the room, probably. But Elijah is straight out like, God, look, like, do you know what's happening in your country? Do you know what's happening in the land of Israel? And God's like, no, Elijah, I don't know. Why don't you tell me? Like God is fully aware, but why does God keep asking the same question? Because he's trying to get Elijah to take a looker, a deeper look inside at what really is going on in his life. And Elijah keeps refusing. 
Elijah, what are you doing here? And God is trying to get Elijah to see. And I, I don't want to spoil it because, well, you all know this story probably. There's a spoiler alert. Hey, you know what? Elijah's not alone. Okay, in case you were concerned about that, we're going to read about that next week when the 7,000 prophets that haven't bowed their knee to Baal, we're going to read about that next week. But God is trying to get Elijah to get out of his own head, to get out of his own narrative and see that God is trying to write a bigger narrative. So here's what I want to do for the next couple of minutes. I want to talk about what do we do when we're in the cave of despair? When we're in the cave of discouragement. When we feel that all is not well in our world. Now, trivia question here. Of all the Psalms that David wrote, I'm not going to ask you to name how many Psalms David wrote. How many of them did he write when he was in a cave? The correct answer is two. The first is Psalm 57, which we're not going to read this morning. And the second is Psalm 142, which we are going to read this morning. David, I love how Bono, the lead singer of U2, puts it. Bono says, David was the original writer and singer of the blues. Okay? Because he knew what it was to suffer. And in both the times he's in a cave, he's on, his run, on the run from Saul. But I want to give to you words. Because I think sometimes when we are in despair and we are in uncertainty and we are in a cave of disappointment or depression, we don't always have the words. And it's interesting that God comes to Elijah in that still small voice, a gentle whisper, a word. So I want you to listen to Psalm 142. And I'm just going to make a few comments as we read it. But I would encourage you to highlight this one. You can look at Psalm 57 as well. But sometimes, I don't know about you, but sometimes Psalm 23 just doesn't cut it for me. Right? I love, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He leads me in green path. You know, like, it's this beautiful, poetic, nice, calm psalm. But sometimes life just is not like that. And that's why I'm glad we have Psalm 142. So listen to this. Here's what David says as he's in the cave of despair. I cry aloud. You want to know how you were to pray? This tells you how to pray before we actually see what he prays. I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out before him my complaint, my lament, my irritation with God and with the world and with Saul and whoever else it is that David is upset with. Before him, I tell my trouble. Now this, when my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who watch over my way. In the path where I walk, people have hidden a snare for me. Look and see, there is no one at my right hand. No one is concerned for me. Huh, sounds kind of like Elijah, right? I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. You think he's in a place of despair? I'm all alone. Saul's after me. I have no place to go. I have no, I have no refuge. But then look how it changes in verse 5. I cry to you, Lord. I say, you are my refuge. My portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry. For I am in desperate need. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they are too strong for me. Set me free from my prison, that I may praise your name. Then the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. Set me free. Lord, show up. Let me know that you are near and that you are good. The problem is this, we don't have the full picture. And as much as we would like to be sovereign, it is only God who is sovereign. There is no one else. The Apostle Paul, as we wrap up this morning, puts it like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 
which we're often used to reading and talking about faith and hope and love and how all, all of these love is the greatest of all and that is all absolutely true. But listen to how he ends 1 Corinthians 13 because I think this is our dilemma, but it is also our hope. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. In verse 11, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. And now this verse at 12. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. This is beautiful because what Paul is saying is saying, God, I know that in you I am fully known. I don't see clearly. I don't see it all, God, but I know you do. And one day, one day, it will all make sense. One day it will all resolve. You see, I think the beauty in one of the teachings in our lesson from 1 Kings 19 today is this. We're all writing a narrative, but what does God do? God writes himself literally into the narrative of our lives. God doesn't just create and say, hey, I hope everything goes well. God instead says, look, I love you so much I'm going to write a narrative and I am putting myself into the story. I am the creator, but I am also the one who is going to walk with you and be there for you. You see, with God, we don't always get the answers. We would love to have the answers. But let me tell you something about answers. They can only do so much. There is no answer that can rescue you. Only Jesus can do that. You might study all you want. You might research all you want. You might come up with answers and all sorts of diatribes and thoughts about this, that, and the other. But in the end, they're a little hollow. Because ultimately, we have to decide Will we trust the one who came to Elijah in the still small voice, who covered Moses, and who then ultimately came for us in Jesus? The God who says, look, your narrative is a little too small, and I'm going to write myself into your narrative so you might have life and you might have hope and you might know that I am God, no matter what comes your way. Pray with me, please. Oh God, for this day, we thank you for your goodness and for your grace. We are grateful. We pray, oh Lord, that you would move within us. Lord, that when we feel trapped, pursued, and imprisoned, that we might turn to you. And as we sing the blues, your spirit might speak to us revealing your goodness and your grace. We pray and ask in Jesus' name, amen.